If you go camping often enough, or in just the right places, you might just see 10-foot tall ghosts, mysterious monsters with especially sharp antlers, and more. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where I'm either retweeting some pretty cool and creepy art, or I just make really lame jokes. That's about it. Anyway, today I've got more new scary camping stories for you to enjoy. Guest narrator Rogue Darkness joins me today to narrate these tales. If you like her voice, be sure to check out the Rogue Darkness podcast, which is all about the crimes committed under the misconceptions of witchcraft and other occult beliefs. Link in the description. Remember, if you have a scary story of your own and you want folks to hear it on this show, send it to me at darkstories.org. I'm looking for stories about state parks or encounters with demons. Now, let's begin. The Backwoods of the Boundary Waters From Primate 5 During the month of July in 2022, a few friends of mine along with their dads were going on a trip into the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters are a huge expanse of totally natural woods, stretching for hundreds of miles. In between these woods are thousands of lakes with small land bridges that we call portages in between the forests. We packed about 200 pounds of gear for five people total. We fit that onto a three-person canoe and a two-person canoe. Before the trip started, I was already nervous of these lands. Due to my native heritage, I've heard many stories about evil spirits and tricksters like the Wendigo, Skinwalker, and Iktomi. Being in their territory of origin was nerve-wracking, along with the knowledge of these spirits enjoying messing with mixed bloods like myself. Starting out at Snowbank Lake, we canoed, portaged, and camped our way deeper and deeper into the woods of the Boundary Waters. It started when we were at the deepest point of our journey, about 15 miles in. My friends J and S had been stung by a wasp and wanted to go back to camp and were discussing the matter. But me being terribly afraid of wasps and insects, I was already gone, sprinting about 15 yards away from them. I knew they would probably be heading back to camp soon to grab medical supplies for their stings, but then I heard a noise that chilled me. A strange, almost uncanny version of what sounded like Jay's voice. All I heard was, Hey. In Jay's soft but commanding voice, warped by something I didn't know. But it came from the opposite direction they were. I froze, feeling goosebumps going up and down my body in waves of fear. Tears welled up in my eyes, and the forest became almost completely silent, except for Jay, S, and their dads talking in the distance. Then, a branch snapped about 25 yards away. As soon as I heard that snapping branch, my head shot right around to strangely shaped branches that I soon realized were antlers. These antlers were seven and a half feet off the ground. My fight-or-flight instinct kicked in. I ran as fast as I ever had before. I bolted back into camp, and when the others looked at me like I was crazy, I told them that I'd run back into the wasp. From then on, I made sure to stay close to everyone else for the rest of the trip. Soon after that, I began to have nightmares. They would lessen in frequency over time, but even now I still have them, as of November 2022. This nightmare is fuzzy, except for one part. A skinwalker-looking creature staring at me from the forest while I'm with my family. Its legs are stretched out as long as possible as it stands at eight feet tall, its teeth halfway bared. In my nightmares, it has red eyes, sometimes yellow, but those eyes always pierce into my consciousness like a dagger. It radiates only one thing, death. Every time I look into its eyes, I have this primal fear, but I can't move. 
Now the dream has progressed to me and my family driving away as fast as we can, pushing 80 miles per hour on a narrow state park road. But no matter how fast we go, it just keeps up. Its legs move effortlessly, still outstretched, running like a man, but something is still very off about it. The nightmare ends soon after, and I wake up for the day. No other anomalies have occurred since the dreams began at the Boundary Waters. I have a cross above my bed and on my doorknob, just in case. Remember to stay aware and safe in the woods. I can't help but feel that I saw something out there. Something with antlers, straight from Native American folklore. Wendigo Behind the Tree, from Kate and the Skinwalker Fan. I was about 14 at the time. It was probably around 10 or 11 p.m. when we heard it. About a week earlier, my friend and I were planning to have a week-long camp out in the woods behind my house. Mind you, I live in the middle of the woods in a very rural area, so my property is teeming with wildlife. Me and her, let's call her Bella for anonymous sake, are accustomed to the occasional howl or shriek of a fox. But on the third night of our camp out, we heard something absolutely terrifying. Now, the first two nights were peaceful and fun, but that all changed very soon. So me and Bella, like we had been doing, went to go start up a fire to roast the marshmallows we had brought. That's when we heard it. A distant shriek. Usually we would have ignored it, putting it off as an animal, but this time it was different. While it was distant, we could clearly make out something that sounded like a moose in heat, and a woman being brutally murdered. Shocked, we both head to the tent and try to distract ourselves. An hour or so passes by and we feel comfortable enough to go back out for a few minutes, talk a bit, and put the fire out. Everything seems to be pretty much normal, until I see it. Behind a rather large tree is one side of large deer antlers. Only this couldn't have been a deer because the antlers were about seven or eight feet off the ground. Knowing deeply that something is wrong, I nudged Bella softly, whispering, Turn around, slowly and make no noise. Following my directions, she turns around, and I can hear a faint gasp emerge from her when this thing emerges from behind the tree. It has deep, yellow eyes that seem to stare straight into your soul. It has the head or skull of a deer, but the body of a seven-foot-tall man that has been starving for three months. Its pale gray skin was barely visible in the faint afterglow of our campfire. I almost vomit when the vile stench reaches us, smelling like a rotting corpse in hot air. I tell Bella to hide in the tent and that I'll be there soon. As soon as she secures the tent, the thing says, Bella, it's gone. You can come out. And to my horror, it was speaking in my voice. I quickly tell her that it wasn't me who said that, but the thing. I slowly retreat into the tent, never letting my gaze fall from the creature. When I get inside, I dive into my sleeping bag, but what happens next will scare me for life. After about two minutes of being in the tent, we hear the same blood-curdling shrill as before, and the thing rips open the top of our tent. Oddly enough, the thing does not attack us, but just stares at us for a good 30 seconds. You'd think we would run, right? No, we do not run. In fact, we do not move a muscle. We were literally paralyzed with fear. I've read about infrasound in school before. It's a technique used by large cats to paralyze their prey before they attack. That's exactly what this felt like. Luckily, I had just remembered the first aid kit I had brought just in case of an emergency. It had a full bottle of rubbing alcohol. I slowly reach for the bottle of alcohol. Then I throw it in the fire and it explodes, throwing flammable gas everywhere. Thankfully, the blast was a shield for us and took all the fire straight to the back. This caused it to give one last ear-piercing scream, shrink down into an unnatural-looking rabbit, and zip back into the forest, never to be seen by us again. To this day, me and Bella have never returned there, and certainly do not plan to. After a long night of research, both me and Bella agree that what we saw was most likely, if not definitely, a Wendigo. The Hunt in the Woods From the Huntress Wolf In Missouri, there are loads of wooded areas you can hunt in. I am a hunter at the age of 22, and I will always remember this horrific event. 
I had asked my parents if I could go hunting with my uncle. They agreed, so I packed my hunting gear in my truck and drove over to my uncle's house. The drive was about three hours long. As soon as I got there, my two friends, Ruki and Luna, were waiting for me. They had been talking to my uncle. Hey, sport, you all set to go? My uncle smiled as I got my hunting gear from the truck. Ready as I'll ever be, I answered back. All four of us got in the hunting truck my uncle owned at the time, and we drove off into his property. His property is a huge piece of land, mostly a wooded area. You could see trees for miles and miles. As we drove, my friends and I discussed ex-boyfriends and drama, and soon we arrived at the hunting spot. My uncle got out and told us, All right, Luna and I will go north, Rookie and Ash, you two go west. And my uncle looked at us seriously. Do not get separated, all right? These woods are dangerous when night falls. We all nodded, and we went in our respective directions. I couldn't help but think that my uncle knew something about these woods. He always told us that warning every time. Ruki and I kept walking, soon setting up camp among the trees. I had with me a rifle and pistol, and Ruki had his 9-gauge and a small pistol, just in case. We sat and waited as the sun began to go down. Suddenly, from the dark, I heard a branch snap. I thought it was my uncle coming to check on us, but what I heard next sent shivers down my spine. A deafening howl coming from right behind us only ten feet away or so. Ash, you heard that, right? Ruki asked as he held his nine gauge in his hands. Yeah? Yeah, I heard it, I replied, holding my rifle close as the sound of heavy footsteps got closer and closer. We aimed our guns in the direction of the noise. From the dark, I saw what looked to be a bear, but bears don't make that kind of howl. I fired the first shot then. Whatever it was screamed in pain. It wasn't enough to kill it, but it was enough to tee it off. We looked at each other and ran. We soon heard it behind us, chasing us. I whistled the kind of whistle my uncle had taught me whenever I was in trouble or needed help if we were far away. At the same time, I heard Ruki taking two shots at the thing behind us before reloading his 9-gauge. When my eyes adjusted, I turned around as I ran, getting a better look at our pursuer. It looked like a person with a wolf skull, but the way it moved and looked everywhere else, I couldn't tell if it was man or something else. Two more gunshots rang out, hitting the creature in the head and in the chest. It was my uncle and Luna. I remember thinking this couldn't be real. Whatever this creature was had taken multiple shots and was not slowing down. We made it back to the truck, and after we climbed in, the creature jumped onto it. As we drove away, we managed to shake the creature off. It rolled onto the ground, howling again. As soon as we made it back to the house, we locked all the doors, every window, and even the basement. My uncle called a Cherokee friend that lived down the road for help. He said that we should not leave the house until morning. We went into our rooms and fell into light, scared slumber. When the next day came, our Cherokee friend came by, performing a blessing ritual on us and the house. What do you think it was? My uncle asked his friend as he gave an odd look. Something whose name we cannot speak. That gave me shivers. At the time, I remember thinking it was a werewolf. But the thought of something like a wendigo or a skinwalker being in Missouri, that's creepy. Never go into the woods alone or unarmed. Possible Skinwalker from Ninja Goldfish We were staying at a campground somewhere in northern Alabama. We stayed there for one night. My parents had just started to pack up the tent. My brother and two younger sisters and I decided to go on a nature walk. At first, we were walking on the pavement, but then we saw an old gravel road that went into an opening in the forest. 
The path continued through the opening and went to the road that was blocked off. The entire time we were walking through the clearing, we heard this howling noise. In the brush that was on the side of the path, you could see a shadow. We could hear something stepping in the leaves. Everyone but my older brother got a little nervous. He said that we should walk back to the camp so we could get his knife. When we got back to the campsite, the howling stopped. My parents said that they were almost done and we could go on one more little walk. My older brother grabbed his knife and we set off. We went to a different path that was close to the other. This path had more trees around it and it was not as long. We could hear the howling again, though. We made it to the road that we had been to before, after about five minutes. There, we heard what sounded like cows mooing, but it didn't sound quite right. It was more distorted. Then, we heard the stomping sounds again. My sisters and I were ready to run back, but our older brother stopped us and told us to walk and act calm. He said that whatever it was, it would chase after us if we ran. When we made it back, we jumped in the car and drove off. We have not told anyone the story ever since. What happened in the Adirondacks? From Jacob Exploration. This happened in a small town with a man-made pond. I won't say the name, but some can probably guess from that. My cousin, my brother, and I went for a hike, like we normally do around the pond. We usually go out around 8 p.m. We did our normal loop, but I convinced both of them to go down the less bright road. I grew up here, hiking and camping in the area. So I knew the area, and I knew all the people down the road, all around 20 of them. So we walked down the road, and when I say it wasn't well lit, that's because the street lamps were spaced farther apart. We soon hit our first dark space, where the lamps didn't light up around maybe two yards. My cousin decided to yell, Oh no, like something happened to him. I turned around to see him throwing a rock like an idiot. I knew it was him trying to scare me or prank me, and to be honest, I get scared easily. I just saw you throw that, I said. He looked at me and smiled, calling me a dummy. We continued to walk on, we were getting close to the part in the road with crappy signal. At least the lighting was better here. From there, we could hear the river nearby, which was drowned out by our stupid jokes and conversations. For the first time in 20 minutes, though, I began to feel as if I was being watched. I couldn't help but glance here and there over my shoulder into the dark woods. Everything seemed pretty quiet. Eventually, my gaze was led over the river, I looked up and down it, and that's when I first saw it. Whatever it was, it was looking at us, motionless. I squinted my eyes, then pushed it off. I figured it was probably just me being paranoid. I was making shapes out of nothing. We kept walking until we got to the more populated area near a road that leads to the highway. We stopped to sit and rest for a while. By then, it was 9 p.m. We'd been walking for about an hour. My cell phone service was back, so I sent a text to my grandma that we'd likely be back around 10 or 10.30 p.m., depending on whether or not we decided to stop at the small pond on the way back. After a few more restful minutes, we began walking back. We walked a bit slower, because to us, 10 minutes was not enough time for rest from a three-mile walk. Not too long after that, I saw that strange figure again. It was in the water near our side of the river now. Then I was certain it wasn't just a shape I was making out of nothing. We kept walking, and I was now scared beyond thought. I then could hear it move out of the water. I decided then to tell my brother and cousin about it. Guys, someone is following us. I think it's a person. They looked and laughed. Sure, why would we believe that? My cousin said in a mocking tone, my brother just giggling. We continued on, and I kept looking behind us every few moments. I would see that thing every few glances, leaning out from around a tree to look at us. It got closer every time too, and then I heard it growl towards the end of the dead signal zone. What was that? My cousin asked. He had heard it too. 
I knew it could only be one thing, that darned thing that was following us. Altogether then, we ran until we made it to an area where there were houses closer together. We stopped then to catch our breaths. I hadn't noticed until I caught my breath, but I was crying. My brother was fine, but we were all shaken up at least somewhat. I noticed my cousin was bleeding. He said it was because he fell while we ran. Once we got back to the town, we sat on the beach, looking at the entrance of the road. Nothing came out, and no one went in. About a month after this experience, we found bloody marks in the rail guard of a small bridge down my road, and there were handprints on it. Update. I last wrote about this thing a month ago, but today I'll share what I saw only a week back. The only reason why I walked down that road again was because quarantine had me stuck with only my family around me. This time it was only me and my cousin. My brother was still too worried to go out there. I myself thought the thing would have left by now because the first anyone saw of it was, as I stated, in my previous post. Now, it wasn't easy getting my cousin to go. I had to bribe him with a $20 bill. The idea was to not go too far, but to still venture down that road somewhat. Maybe hike, maybe camp, who knows. We left after dinner, and God knows what time it was. We didn't go all the way down the road, we only walked a bit, in the direction that leads to my friend's house. I even called her up and asked if we could go onto her property, and she was okay with it. Around 10 minutes into the trails, we began to hear sticks snapping behind us. I quickly remembered what had happened last time. I didn't wait around at all, I began sprinting away until I heard, it's just me. I turned around, seeing that it was my brother who had decided to come and join us. I yelled at him to never do that again. About an hour into the walk, being under a canopy of trees, it got dark fast. My brother and cousin were now fooling around, yelling dumb things to each other. It's just, it's me. just me. I turned to look at my brother and mockingly said, we know you already said that. But he was looking deep into the forest like a deer in headlights. I didn't say it that time. I looked in the direction he was looking but I didn't see anything. Come on, let's get to the road. We began to hurry down the trail, and as if it was a horror movie, I tripped. I stood up and checked myself. I could still walk. My arm hurt quite a bit, but there was no blood. I stood up and began to walk down the trail. It's just, it's me. just me. The voice came again. I ignored it, but I ended up tripping once more, not as hard this time but with how scared I was, I ended up curling up in a ball, and I just lay there. As much as I hate to admit it, I began to cry. The voice got closer, saying the same thing over and over. I sat there, and eventually I passed out. I woke up and looked around. There it was. Even in the dimming light, I was able to see it clearly. It was taller than I thought when I first saw it, it looked to stand around eight feet tall. It was ungodly pale, a sickish grin on its face, and it looked as if there was nothing where its eyes should be. It opened its mouth, and out came the words, It's just me! It's just me! It's it's just just me. me. Then I passed out again. When I came to, I was near a rock circle. Freaking out, I looked around to see my cousin and brother sitting on one of the rocks. Where are we? They looked at me. It's our normal spot. I started to look around again. It was our normal spot. I guess I've never seen it at night. What happened? They explained how they found me a few feet off the trail, passed out. They brought me here, as they knew it was close. We camped there, under our base that we made a year ago. We built it because we were bored, and being the oldest, I had brought out a bunch of camping stuff. We had found this area back then that was like a circle. It was near a shallow cave thing or overhang, and at night if you didn't know the area well, you might fall in the shallow pool of water. We turned our lantern on, 
talking about everything that happened, preparing to be yelled at by our parents for not coming back that night. Most of that night was spent in the hangover behind the stick lean-to walls, putting band-aids on my cuts. In the morning, we began to walk back home. Nothing out of the ordinary happened then. And as we had guessed, we did get reprimanded when we got back. But I truly will never forget what I saw. Goatman in Big Sur, California, from C. Philly 100. Many years ago, roughly 2010 or so, some buddies and I were traveling up the west coast from Joshua Tree to Big Sur, where we stopped to camp for the night. We got our tent set up and walked down to the coast. To get down to the water, you have to pass through some thick undergrowth and a big stand of trees. We heard what we thought was a goat or sheep or something, and we noticed a vile odor hanging rank in the air. We had a nice little buzz going, so we didn't really pay too much attention to this, but kept on our merry way down to the beach. It was getting dark, and it was pretty chilly, but my friend Chance and I jumped in the water, splashing around in the waves and having a ball. Back up on the beach, we drank some wine and reveled in the magic that is California. The stars were just starting to come out, as the sun sank out of sight and the moon rising to the east marked the changing of the guard. We heard that, bah sound again, and smelled the rotten trash smell and decided to head back to camp. As soon as we entered the wood, I could sense that something was different. There was a distinct feeling that we were being watched. You know that feeling? Where the hair on the back of your neck stands up? Yeah, well, it's a pretty creepy feeling, and one I was feeling in spades at that particular point in time. It had gotten pretty dark by then, and it was even darker in the thick coastal forest. I thought I saw someone or something up on the trail ahead of us, but whatever it was ran off before we got close enough to see what it was. There was that smell again. What the heck is that smell, man? Chance asked. I don't know, I said, but it's making me want to hurl. Suddenly, a branch started shaking violently about 20 yards off to our left, which was weird because the forest was dead calm otherwise. What the? Something came charging out of the thicket, something tall, and I mean tall at least eight or nine feet. It was bipedal and had horns on the top of its head. Run! I yelled at the top of my lungs, and run we did, crashing through the briar and bramble all the way back to camp where we jumped in the car and turned on the lights. Nothing. What the hell was that thing? Chance exclaimed. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know! I couldn't quite process what had just happened. Just then, something walked out into the headlights. It was that... that creature... It had the body of a muscle builder, but its head looked similar to that of a goat. It didn't look quite like a regular farm goat, though. Maybe more like a mountain goat, or very similar to depictions of the French Baphomet. A rather sinister and wicked-looking goat, with pale blue eyes that gleamed brightly in the headlights. I swear it looked like it was smiling at us. It leaped forward, springing off of the ground and landing hard on the hood of the car. Drive! 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 I shouted. Chance punched on the gas and the Goatman creature stepped up onto the roof of the car, and I noticed that it had swollen hocks and huge cloven hooves for feet. Its hands, however, looked like those of a large human man. It started stomping on the roof of the car, almost causing us to swerve off the road. Chance hit the brakes and the Goatman went flying forward, landing on its feet before running off into the woods. We started driving and didn't stop till we got back to civilization, where we got gas and then kept driving. I feel bad about leaving all our gear in our tent and everything behind, but there was no way in hell we were going back there to get it. I don't know if anyone else has seen this Goatman creature out there in Big Sur, but consider yourself warned. California Goatman, let's never meet again. The Tall Shadow From Daniel S. This is not my experience. Rather, it is a group experience that consisted of a couple of youth members and a youth leader named E from our church, my little brother included. In August of 2019, several youth ministries from our denomination of church got together at a camp located near Santa Barbara. We were there for three days. On the second night, we had a campfire. After it ended, my friends and I went with the youth leader and his cabin kids to their cabin. It was closer to the campfire area than ours. We told a couple of spooky stories and my group left to our cabin. We ate a small meal and went to sleep. 
The next morning at breakfast time, we heard one of the female leaders, A, from our church, asking around if we'd heard what happened last night. I guess she was told by the wife of E. So for breakfast, we were sitting together, and A told us the experience. This is how it went. E and his cabin kids had a youth from a different cabin. It was already 2 a.m., and they had to walk him back to his cabin, which was by the campfire. They had to walk the road to reach the western cabins. On this road, there were no lamps nor light posts, and they had to carry flashlights with them. They would soon be passing by a grove of trees by the RV storage, and after passing by it, E felt a very negative energy. Then everyone froze. The kids were the first to turn around. They all audibly gasped. E turned then too, and what he saw appeared to be a shadow standing over 10 feet tall, but it didn't move an inch. Everyone screamed, running towards the western cabins from the road. They didn't stop running until they made it to the cabin of the youth they were returning. After dropping him off, E's group hesitantly walked back. Luckily, they didn't experience anything else, and that tall shadow wasn't there on the way back. Back at their cabin, they were unable to fall back to sleep, and they were up ready on Sunday morning before anyone else. He and his youth told us afterwards, and that's everything. Wendigo and Taos, from Trace, Andrew. This story happened when I was around 19. Me and my three friends were out on a camping trip double date in Taos, New Mexico. It was midsummer, so me and my friends drove three hours north to Taos, New Mexico, telling jokes and listening to music. When we arrived, we started setting our tents and chairs up. Then I noticed that Jack's girlfriend was not acting normal. Her happy, talkative self was now quiet and sad. I told Jack, Hey, you should go see what's wrong with her. He walked off in her direction. Me and my girlfriend sat and watched Jack and his girlfriend. When Jack walked up to his girlfriend, she broke down crying. Jack then carried her into their tent, and she told Jack why she was acting so strange. She said that when she was 12 years old, she went on a camping trip with her mom and dad. She said something about a wendigo attacking her dad. It was hard to tell what she was saying because she was crying so much. They sat in the tent for a few hours, while me and my girlfriend started a fire and made food. We ate, put out the fire, and then went to our tents. The next day, we woke up and went on a 20-mile hike. We had a lot of fun, so it was time to head back to camp. A little side note, the hike was 20 miles there and back, so it wasn't a super long hike. We got back around at around 5 o'clock. We went out to my cousin's house. We talked about motorcycles, ATVs, and anything that interested us. It was getting late, so we said our goodbyes and went back to camp. Me and my girlfriend were exhausted, so we went to sleep right away. My girlfriend woke me up and said in a hushed voice, Babe, wake up. Do you hear those noises? It is probably just Jack and Adria getting it up, I replied half awake. No, it's not them. Just listen, she said. Then I heard the voices. They were more like a noise. It sounded like a choir, but deep and demonic. The voice had no emotion and was really harsh. I know you're in there, Trace, the thing said while laughing. I told my girlfriend that we should start praying. Then she said, Wait, do you hear that? It sounds like Adria crying. I'll go check on her. Stay here and don't do anything but pray, I said. I quickly unzipped the zipper on the tent and then walked over to Jack and Adria's tent. I opened the tent and walked in. I knelt down by Adria and asked her in a hushed voice, Hey, Adria, is everything okay? There is someone outside telling me to go out into the woods. It sounds like my dad, but I know it's not him. Adria responded through quiet sobs. I felt bad for Adria, so I told her that I'm going to get my girlfriend and that I'll be right back. I left to go to my tent to get my girlfriend. I had a feeling that someone was behind me. I felt a cold breath on my back. My brain told me not to turn around, but something made me turn around. I saw a creature that had patches of greenish-brown hair on it and had parts of rotting flesh on its body, and it had the head of an elk with antlers, but it had sharp teeth that were dripping saliva. The smell hit me like a freight train. The smell was like moldy dead skunks. I threw up all the food my cousin had gave me. I was scared. I walked back into my tent and shut the zipper. My girlfriend asked me what had happened. Nothing. I just saw a bobcat. I lied to her, which made me feel even worse, because I'm a terrible liar. 
and she looked at me with disappointment in her face. She went to look out of the tent. I tried to stop her, but she wouldn't listen to me. She opened the tent and said, There's nothing out here, babe. I looked out the tent door and sighed with relief. I told her that we needed to go back to Jack and Adria's tent. I told her that I'd have Adria explain why she was crying. My girlfriend and I walked over to Adria, where my girlfriend sat there and listened to Adria and began to comfort her. I went back to my tent and left my girlfriend with Jack and Adria. I waited for any noise or movement. I started to doze off, but then I heard a low, growling sound. I jumped at the sound and saw my tent zipper moving. My heart stopped and I held my breath. I let out a sigh of relief when I saw it was my girlfriend walking into the tent. We have to go now, she nearly yelled at me. Okay, get your bag and phone and we'll come back for our stuff tomorrow. We got in the truck and left to my cousin's house. I told my cousin about everything that had happened, and as soon as I mentioned when to go, Adria started freaking out and hyperventilating. My cousin's wife went over to Adria and asked her if she wanted tea or something. Adria said yes, so Michelle, my cousin's wife, went to the kitchen. Jack didn't even have a nightmare, or smelt the rotten smell, or even the growling sound. Jack was the lightest sleeper I had ever met. He would wake up if your heartbeat was too loud. We have never gone camping again. Jack and Adria are married now, and me and my fiancé are getting married in July of 2022. I want to be cremated. From the Gravedigger. My dad is a gravedigger. So he's always around graves, and has dug hundreds of them. I'll be telling this story from his point of view, as this was his experience. I had just finished digging a grave after hours. I was very tired and headed home for the day. The next day, when I came back to the graveyard, the hole I'd been digging was filled in. I thought maybe the hole had collapsed in, but it had been padded down and there were prints from dress shoes on the padded down dirt. After I called the priest, my boss, he said nobody should have filled it in. So it was up to me to dig it all out again. After hours of redigging the hole, it was done. It was completely dug out again. I headed home at 6 p.m. The next morning I went back to check on the hole, and sure enough, someone again filled it in with more of the same shoe prints on the dirt. I told the priest, and he had me set up a camera after I redug the hole for a third time, leaving at 5 p.m. The following morning, I went to check the footage. It was recording up until 2 a.m. and cut out for two hours, then recorded again at 4 a.m. Lo and behold, the hole was filled back in. I was starting to get really teed off. I told the priest I was going to camp out after redigging the hole because the funeral was on Sunday and it was Thursday. So I camped out next to the hole. As I was trying my best to stay awake, I suddenly caught movement out of the corner of my eye. I ran from my camping spot and yelled, Hey, don't move! There was a man standing next to the hole. When they turned around, I saw that he was wearing a tuxedo and dress shoes. To be more specific, this was the same man I was supposed to put six feet under on Sunday. The man I'd been digging a grave for had been hit by a truck. His face had split open from the impact. So there he was, split open face, pale and all. I ran out of there as fast as I could. We talked to the man's family. They ended up getting him cremated instead, as the grave thing was not working out. I never did tell the family that I saw their dead family member filling in his own grave. Cold Hand, Dead Hand, from Tana I'm sure you think this is a load of crap when you first hear about my story. This happened to me when I was a teenager, probably the age of 16. For reference, I'm a 24-year-old female, currently living in South Africa. My story starts like any other usual event. We went out doing teenager things, not really noticing our surroundings. We were camping in the mountains of the Winelands region. It's a popular thing to do here. Anyway, I was with my sister, let's call her Jenna, and my dad. We always camped out in the mountains, some spiritual underlying thing my dad believed in. It wasn't that cold, as summer in South Africa can be hectic. It was around 10 p.m. when I had to get out of my tent to pee. It was warm, so I had on my track pants and a tank top and flip-flops. 
I took my flashlight and went down the little awkward pathway about 20 meters from the camp. I'm sure you know how quiet things are when it's in the middle of the night. I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings when I accidentally stepped on a loose rock and fell three meters on my back at the bottom of the ledge. I was hurt and the fall knocked the wind out of me. I crawled upright and I heard something or someone whisper in a language I didn't understand. I said hello and then I felt a cold hand touch my leg. I freaked out and scrambled to get away. I was yelling for my dad, but with my position, the wind made it impossible for anyone to hear me. I crawled towards the ledge and I just kept hearing someone whisper in my ear, almost maniacally trying to get me to fall again. Once I yanked myself back on the pathway, the voice got louder and that cold hand grabbed me firmly. I screamed and hauled tail back to my tent. That was the scariest moment of my life. Middle Creek Battlefield from KSDC This story happened in September of 2019. It was my second year doing the Battle of Middle Creek reenactment. If you've ever heard of Middle Creek, here's some info. The Battle of Middle Creek happened on January 10th, 1862. The Union Army, commanded by future President James A. Garfield, was trying to push the Confederate Army out of eastern Kentucky. They did so, and that is the reason why Garfield got into government and paved his way to the White House. Now, I must say that Middle Creek wasn't a deadly battle. No more than 10 killed on each side. But it was the scariest battlefield I've ever been on. Even scarier than when I visited Gettysburg earlier that year. When you're on that battlefield, you can feel something. Like a presence. A feeling you're not alone. The first night, me and my friends went down to the battlefield just to see what we could see, feel, or hear. Right away, there were feelings of not being alone. We'd brought with us some dousing rods. They were two L-shaped rods. You touch them to the ground and ask a question to the departed. If the answer is no, it will pull apart, and it will cross if it's yes. We asked simple questions at first. Anyone here? Etc. Then we moved on to personal questions. I believed at one point we talked to a Union soldier. We asked if he hated the rebels. He answered no. We asked, did he join the war to save the Union? And he said yes. We then asked if he was killed here. And he said yes. All of us felt pretty sad about this. We spoke about it for a minute. Then I asked, do you know that you're dead? The answer came back, no. We weren't surprised, to be honest. Not much of a reaction from any of us. I told the spirit, the war is over. The Union won. It's okay to leave. Go towards the light. I'm tearing up writing this. Not in the sad way, though. The entire time we didn't feel a bad feeling, but we did feel a heavy, saddening feeling. All of a sudden, the feeling went away. I believed we saved a trapped spirit that night. My friend R started to cry. Not a hard cry, but a quiet weep. But that's not everything. The following night, we got done with the reenactment that day, so until dark, we went to the town and goofed off some. At Middle Creek, we have a night battle at 8. To wake the spirits for the ghost walk, me, J, H, and A were put in a group as soldiers. They say you get more activity when you're in a uniform. We crossed the road and went to a super small open field. The tour guide gave some info about the spot. It was a place where Confederate artillery were placed during the battle. We then gave a volley of gunfire and I marched my small company around. As we came back up the hill, some fellow reenactors decided to join us. They hopped out of bushes and fired guns at us as a joke. They got us for sure. We crossed the road and stopped at a wooden fence. I noticed my friend Jay was acting off. I walked up and said, you okay? He looked at me wide-eyed and told me to get away. Of course, I was curious as to why he said that, but I did as he wanted. I told A about this and she took him over and talked to him. Once he calmed down, he told us that when I was marching them around, he got these sudden thoughts to take his rifle which had a bayonet attached, and kill me, then kill A and H. 
something he'd never think to do. He also said he was taken over by a feeling of rage. Thoughts rushed him of all the people that had hurt him in the past. The next story happened when my group and the other group switched places in the field. Before we went, my friend R told me to be sure to fire a salute and to say, this is for the men who fell on both sides. When we got there, we of course did that. Now there's a corner we do not go to at Middle Creek. For reasons I've learned, in that corner is a very bad spirit. He was summoned when someone played with a Ouija board, years back, and that person never said goodbye. J and A had left, so it was only me and H in the group. They began going to that corner, me and H were not going at all. We began to head back to camp. Middle Creek is a medium-sized field with a big cluster of trees in the middle. We were walking in the trees when all of a sudden we got a bad feeling. It felt like it was all around us, and it was starting to close in. Then, my vision began to blur. My head felt light. Then it looked as if H was going to start crying. We ran, running all the way back to our big tent at the campsite, staying there until the group got back. When they did get back, they brought a boy with them. The boy was super shaken up, crying uncontrollably. Apparently, he had suddenly just broke down when they made it to that corner I mentioned. Suddenly, out of nowhere, this woman shows up and puts a crystal necklace around his neck. She says something, I don't remember what, but the boy began to seize up and fell to the ground unconscious. I'm not sure what to think about that entirely, to be honest. The final two things are small but interesting. The first one was before Jay left. I noticed two small straight red marks on his left wrist. When we were over in the small field, his entire wrist was covered, so there's no way anything could have done it that I know of. Last, my friend R told me that in the same field, he, along with my other friends C and Q, saw a huge figure standing nine feet tall. All Q could say was, holy crap. All three were non-believers in spirits until that very night. I'm still going back this year. I can't wait. Maybe I'll have more stories when I get back. Don't look behind you from Mr. Jerk. My brother and I lived on about four acres growing up. The closest town was about five miles away, and our house is surrounded by cornfield and bean fields and a cemetery about a half mile away. There was a few houses and barns around us, and there were woods in the middle of one of the fields along with a few creeks. We are three years apart, him being older. We did everything together, fishing, camping, riding our bikes, you name it. We had our own rooms, but we shared a room because we did not want to be apart. We did fight like all brothers do, however we always make up. We're both in our mid-forties now, and we still talk to this day every day. One night, we were camping in the backyard. It was late, summer, early fall. It was a cool night, and we were camping right on the property line next to the field. All you can hear was the corn rustling and crickets chirping, and him and I told stories beside a crackling fire. It was his turn to tell a story. So he started telling the story, and the next thing you know, he grabbed his shoe and put out the fire, and I said, what are you doing? But he grabbed my mouth and told me to shut up. Don't look behind you. I asked him why once again, and he told me to shut up. We hid on the ground and did not move for about 20 minutes and didn't say a word to each other. Next thing I know, he grabs my hand and we run to the house. The next day, our mom asked us why we were back inside. Were we scared? Did you see something? My brother looked at me and said, no, why? I followed his lead and said no. The same day I heard my mother talking to a neighbor, asking them if they had seen anything last night. When my mom got off of the phone, she told us that there was a grave robbery at the cemetery down the road from us. So later that day, my mom took us to the cemetery and we went to the old part of the cemetery and sure enough, there was a grave opened up and the casket was missing. The caretaker was quick to fill in the grave. There was talk around town about devil worshippers being close to town. And the only thing I can think of is that they robbed the grave and walked through the field right behind us to the woods. To this day, my brother will not tell me what he had seen. The Little Boy from Gettysburg From Bleak Mountain A few years ago, when I was still in middle school, my family and I went to go camping in Gettysburg, 
with my sister's now husband's family. We went camping there a lot. My family still does, but I just stay home now, since all they do is basically park a big camper in a trailer park, full of other campers. Well, that time we did go with my sister's now husband's family, we decided to go on a ghost tour in downtown Gettysburg. The tour guide was decent enough. The whole tour was pretty cool, walking around old downtown Gettysburg, listening to local stories of soldiers' ghosts and civilians' ghosts. Most of them were about all the soldiers who had died there fighting during the Civil War. I can't say that anything paranormal really occurred on the tour, though. Not until we went into this one old brick house with bullet holes in the side from the war. The tour guide brought us up the stairs to the attic. He said during or around the war, I can't remember exactly when, there was a little boy who was on the road and got hit by a carriage which was on its way through town. The little boy was in very bad condition when they rushed him upstairs to the same exact attic that we resided in then. The boy died either the same or the next day. In the attic, they put benches up against the wall closest to the attic door, where my family sat at. I sat against the other wall facing them, as did the tour guide. Behind the tour guide and I was a display case with the little boy's toys inside. As the tour guide was speaking about the little boy, suddenly the attic door flew right open, making everyone in the room gasp. Now, I was thinking to myself, even though I was shocked by the door opening by itself, that timing seemed a little too perfect. I bet the door had an automatic switch the ghost tour set up to scare people. I didn't think that for long, though. While everyone was still flabbergasted by the door that mysteriously flew open on its own, I felt something heavy push down on my lap, as if someone were sitting in my lap. I just sat there wide-eyed, freaking out, not speaking a word. Whenever we went to leave the attic, after the little boy's ghost story was done, I tried to sit up, but I could still feel the presence on my lap. After I sat up completely, the feeling disappeared. Later on, I told my family about it, but they didn't really seem to think much of it. Not that they didn't believe me, since they do believe in the paranormal. They just didn't seem to say much about it. Although something did get them to start talking after we finished the tour when we were walking back to our cars. You see, cannons fired out of nowhere in the middle of the night. This was July 4th to make matters even more crazy. Reenactors indeed do fire blanks out of guns and cannons down there, but never at night. The cannons firing really made everyone surprised, and folks went on and on about it all the way back to the campground. Wolf Pack from the Lone Wolf. This happened a few months ago. My wife, who I'll refer to as Rachel, and I live in Colorado. We have our whole life. One day, we decided to go camping, but only for four days due to my wife being pregnant. We wanted to make this camping trip a happy memory before we got to be parents, so we packed up the usual camping stuff like food, water, fishing rods, and a map. I also brought along my shotgun just in case. When all our stuff was on the truck, we headed to our favorite camping spot. When we arrived, I unpacked and set up our camp so that Rachel wouldn't do a lot of work. The camping spot we were in was beautiful and was full of a lot of animals. My wife then called out to me, Honey, look at this! I went to where my wife was and there was a nice lake with deer and elk coming in to have a drink. It's nice, isn't it? Rachel said. It sure is, I replied. We stayed there for a couple of minutes while I was fishing and at the same time watching the animals come and go. After that, I decided we would go hiking up the mounts. Rachel agreed, and we made our way up the mount. By the time we arrived to the top of the mountain, the sun was already setting, so we sat there and held each other as we watched the sun go down. When the sun was gone from sight, and the night was settling in, we heard a howl off in the distance. What was that? said Rachel. It's probably a wolf, I replied. Wolves are common here in Colorado. We then started to hike back down to our camp. When we got back, we ate dinner and roasted some marshmallows. Then, we soon decided to go to sleep. Before I went into the tent, I put some more wood on the fire to keep the animals away. I then went inside the tent, and Rachel and I fell asleep. A few hours later, I woke up to Rachel shaking me awake. Honey, wake up! 
When I was fully awake, I asked her, Babe, what is it? I heard something outside. I looked through the tent window and didn't see anything at first, other than the fire almost out. But that's when I heard a growl. Not just one, but a lot of growls. I told my wife that I thought it was a pack of wolves outside. She was beginning to get afraid and wanted me to take the shotgun to make them go away. So I did. But before I did, I told Rachel, Hun, if I don't come back, run back to the truck and get help. I love you. When I got out of the tent, I walked around the campsite, but didn't find anything. I then started to walk back to the tent, when I heard the growls again. I pulled out my flashlight and shined it in the direction of the growls, and what I saw made me afraid of camping. There was a whole pack of wolves. There must have been at least six or seven of them. I dropped my flashlight and raised the shotgun and pulled the trigger. The sound of the shot echoed through the woods. I then heard the wolves run away and faded into the woods until I couldn't hear them anymore. I then ran back to the tent, afraid that one of them would come back and jump on me. Luckily, that never happened. I ran inside and saw my wife crying. I embraced her and hugged her. Honey, it's all right. They're gone. We're safe, I told her. She then said to me, crying, I thought you were gone. No, I'm here now. After a few minutes, I managed to calm my wife down, and then we were able to sleep. In the morning, we cut the trip short, and we packed all of our stuff and left for home. This experience has scarred me for life. What could have been a romantic memory with my wife turned out to be a horrific memory. A few months later, my wife and I had our child and we moved from Colorado to Wyoming. We still go camping and nothing has happened, and I'm glad we were never attacked by any wolves. If you live in Colorado, be aware and stay safe. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.